Hello and welcome to My Own Worst Enemy. I was going to start reading through the Carrier Battle Philippine Sea rulebook and going through the tutorials and learning the game so that I could do a playthrough, but I thought, why not go ahead and just do some videos on uh, how to learn this thing, basically, and, and what the uh, what the rulebook recommends. And so I want, I'm just going to do a, a maybe a couple of these. I may do all the tutorial scenarios this way if there's positive feedback and, it's, and, and you find it helpful. I do want to start off saying though that, you know, if you, if you get the rule book out, there is a section 1.2, how to learn the game. And I'll show you that there, how to learn the game. And it basically what it says to do, it says, we strongly recommend you begin by reading rule section one and section three. So that's game equipment and sequence of play. Then read through the comprehensive example of play in the playbook and then start with scenario number one. Uh, I did skim through this rule book, and what I will tell you is that I, I, I recommend what they say here with a little bit of modification. So th these rules are, they don't look as difficult as initially that I thought what they might be, which is good, but they are different than what, and they tell you this, the rules are different than what you'd normally find in a war game. It's not, there's some concepts in here that are, you know, this being a solitaire only game, they're different than what you are used to. So what I would recommend is read sec read the whole thing. Start with section one and read all the way through section four. But as you do this, as you're going through the game equipment and the sequence of play, have these things in front of you. Get the components out. And as they're talking about the components, look at them while reading this so that you can understand what, what is going on. It makes it a little clear if you actually have these components out and you're, you're actually reading the book, the sections, and looking at the components, putting your hands on the components. That will be, it will make things much easier for you is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, look at the components as you go through, but I, I do recommend following along just like they say, and that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna actually play through scenario one in just a second here. The other thing I wanna note is that the game does come with 10 Ziploc baggies to put the counters in, but what I did was I grabbed an Aegis counter tray that I had and uh, unmathematical scientific finding here is that each cup can hold about roughly, I think about 56 counters. But what I did, there's three counter sheets to this game. So I divvied up, there's 10, let's see, now there are, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five. So there are 20 cups, if you will. I divided that by the three counter sheets and kind of equally gave each counter sheet you know, I think it was, I think it turned out to be seven, seven, and six. But what I did was just, each counter sheet is, is in the sections. But I, with a little modification to that, I did put the carriers for the Americans, the U.S. side up here. These are carriers only. These are Japanese carriers only. Then we get into ships. Then we get into fighters and bombers for the American side. And then um, the air units for the Japanese side are over here. This little middle section tends to be where I tended to be where I put all of the game markers, informational type markers. And same thing for this side. It's just some, they're, they're grouped. Not a lot of logic put into this. I just kind of quickly moved them from the counter sheets into the tray here. So I think this will work, but I may modify this later. I don't know. And I did clip the, the counters. Let me see if I can show you one of the counters. I did clip these and they turned out rather nice. I used a two millimeter organ laminations, deluxe laminations tool with a two millimeter instead of the 2.5. And I think they turned out nice. So that's what I did for counter storage. All right, so this first scenario, let me grab the scenario book here. We will set this up together. We'll just go right through it. So this, this first scenario, let's go back to the very beginning. So it's scenario one, hey Rube. And so basically this is going to show you how air combat works. And we're gonna see that, we're gonna go through this. It's a very small scenario. We're gonna go through it together and set it up. Now, if I get something wrong, and this is why I'm gonna do this, cause I'm learning too. If I get something wrong, please tell me in the comments below. That will help everyone learn how to do this correctly. So let's go ahead and start. So it says for the Japanese setup, you're gonna place a air raid marker. And this is the um, 1A air raid marker for the Japanese. That's gonna go into hex 1411, which is where this carrier symbol is. So we're gonna put it there. So for the, that's, that's all you do for the Jap, well, that's not quite all you do. You also have to get the Butai mark, uh, board out. And what I'm gonna do, because you're only using this small section of the map, I'm gonna fold this in half, put this towards the top, because we're only gonna be using this top portion of this chart. And I'm gonna grab the Japanese fighter 
counter markers. And it tells you that there's gonna be two fighters. So we're gonna put two fighters in the fighter box of this chart. So there's two fighters and then the attack aircraft. So you have your interceptors, they call them, your fighters, and then the attack aircraft are your aircraft that would be attacking the carriers or other ships that you may have or the land-based units. So there's seven of those attack aircraft. So this is probably bombers coming in here to attack the fleet we're gonna see here in a second. So that's the Japanese side setup. I'm gonna to try to get this a little straighter on camera here. And then next we have the US side setup. So it says to take task force 58, and that is this task force marker. And that is gonna go into hex 1408. So that is gonna be right here. So they're starting off pretty close together. Now it's irrelevant, the scenario tells you, we're not gonna worry about ships in that, this is about air combat. So don't worry about ships, just put the task force marker out there to show where that fleet is. And then the US side is going to get some air missions and units. We are gonna start with intercept number one. Now inter there's two kinds of air missions you can have. There's these intercept missions, and I believe they're called attack missions. So the attack missions are where you're actually trying to attack targets, aircraft carriers, battleships, whatever. The interceptors are just that. They're trying to intercept enemy aircraft that are coming in towards your task force. So we're gonna take this intercept number one and it says to start intercept number one on Guam. So Guam is over here. That's hex, uh, what hex is that? That is hex 1605. So we're gonna put the marker which shows that intercept air mission group. And then what it makes up, what makes up intercept number one are three F6Fs, so Hellcats. So we get three Hellcats that we are gonna put with air mission one. So intercept one, that's air mission one. So you're gonna put three of these fighters out to show you have three of those fighters. And then you've gotta, you've gotta show how much fuel they are. One of the neat things about this game is you're tracking fuel, which is missing in some of the other games I've been playing. So this is kind of neat. So we're gonna place the fuel marker at nine. So air mission one, those, they're gonna start out with nine fuel. And then we're gonna have another one. We're gonna have intercept number two. And this is gonna start off with the task force. We put it with the task force. They're gonna have two fighters. Again, so that's intercept two is air mission two. And they're also gonna start with nine fuel that they're gonna to have to track. And finally, there is a reinforcement phase that we will hit and I'm just gonna take the markers, that's gonna be intercept number three, and basically what that's gonna represent are more fighters coming off the carrier decks in that task force, but we're just gonna set those aside for now, and they will come into play at the, I believe it's the second air, US air movement, but we'll get to that in just a second. All right, so that is it as far as counters that we're gonna use that are actually on this board. It's like a very, this is an introductory scenario, not much to it, which is good. Now they also tell you that you should have in front of you Chart number one, this is the only chart that you'll need for this game. And the reason you need it is because there is air-to-air -air combat for the US side and the Japanese side. And again, we're not using these task groups. So I'm just gonna put this here so we can check it easier than if it were off the table. We can see it is what I should be trying to say. And the other thing that we're missing that they tell you you need is the game turn, game turn flow chart. So this is, tells you where you are in a turn and yet again, Let's just put it over here because we're not using any of this side of the board. So we have everything on camera, which is what we want. And I should probably show you, this is, this is scenario one. So this is, it tells you exactly what you need to set up. And that's just all I'm stepping through. Game duration will go until this Japanese air raid force is in the same hex as the task force. And we've gone through the US intercept segment. The sequence of play, it tells you you will only use, really in this scenario, three, three segments in the sequence of play. So we're gonna use the Japanese air movement, we are going to use the US air movement, and then we're gonna use the US intercept, and that's the only three we're gonna use. However, for the very first turn, we will skip the Japanese air movement. So we're gonna start with the US air movement segment. So let's do that. We'll put the marker where we're starting on the game turn flow chart here. The other notes below that, it tells you for Japanese movement, they're gonna move two hexes per segment. Or So they're gonna move two hexes towards the target hex in a straight line. It doesn't matter where our aircraft are, it doesn't matter anything, what's on the board, 
if there were fight our fighters in front of this thing, it's going to move two hexes towards the target. So nothing we can do about that. That's just the way it is. We're going to start again with the U.S. movement first, though. The other thing that it talks about is U.S. fuel. It says that any U.S. air unit which reaches a fuel level of zero is removed from play. So if, if any air unit gets down to zero, it's going to come out of play. Now that's a little different than the normal rules. If you're playing a normal game, you can actually run out of fuel and up to a point and it will have a different impact on what the fighters can and cannot do. But that, we're not going to worry about that now. We're, this is strictly very basic overview of air combat. And the next thing they talk about are U.S. reinforcements. Again, that's over here. Those will come in once we hit the second U.S. air movement segment. So we're going to start with that. When we get back to it, those reinforcements will come in, and they will come in on Task Force 58 there. And then there's some game variations. We're not going to use those. I'm not going to use them. We're going to keep this as basic as we can. You can see there the uh, game variation, but we're not going to worry about that. This is, this is strictly Scenario 1 air combat and how that works. So that is it for the setup. The only thing left to do then is to actually start playing the scenario. So we will start with U.S. Air Movement Segment. Now, one thing I do love about this game so far is under, and I'll show you this too up close, the game term flowchart, we're starting here in this Air Movement Segment. You'll note that the, the section in the rule book is noted there too, so it's very easy to find information that on these rules of how to do this. So, you know, have your rule book out when you're going through this and the scenario book as well. And also these cards also have, they're really good as far as containing information that you're going to need. And we'll see it when we get into combat. So, I, so far it looks like a really good job of referencing the rules. I will say that my initial reading through the rule book and the scenarios, there's a little bit of ambiguity. It's not as clean as I would like it to see. But it's so far so good. So I'll, I'll probably have more to say about the, how the rule book is written at some point. But it's, it's okay so far. I'm not thrilled completely with it, but it is, it's good. Let's just say it's good and go with that for now. All right, so we are going to move all of our air missions. And we only have two out there so far. So let's just start with, let's start with the carrier first. We'll start with intercept air mission two. So we want to get these fighters over to that that incoming Japanese wave of fighters. So we have a choice here. We, we, can, we can move one hex that will cost us one fuel point, and I'll have to deduct that. It's as simple as that if you just want to move one hex. We, can, we also have the option of moving an extra hex. So we could move two hexes this turn. If you, move, if you choose to move two hexes though, you're going to have to roll a D10. And if you look at the, this is card number one front, it tells you you have a, a fuel expenditure summary. So that first movement, zero to one hexes, is going to cost you one fuel point. Easy enough. If you want to move two hexes, you're going to roll this d10. If you roll a one through five, it's going to cost you one extra fuel point. If you roll anything higher than that, it's going to cost you two extra fuel points. So if I wanted to move this fighter group two hexes, it, it could cost three fuel points to move. Fuel is important. You need it to move and you're also going to need it to engage in combat. And to engage in combat, it's three fuel points. So you can see already, you know, that, that would be six fuel points if we wanted to move an attack already gone, spoken for. So you gotta, you've got to watch your fuel here. And I love that in this game, again, carrier battles, right? You're going to have to watch your fuel consumption. So that's neat. So in this case, I'm going to take intercept group number one. And I'm just going to move in one hex. You move your intercept marker on the board. Intercept two, move forward one, and then you deduct one fuel point for doing so. Again, I could try to move it again, and not try to move it, I could move it again at the cost of extra fuel, but I don't want to do it. Now, my logic here is, if you remember I said that the, this Japanese air raid group is going to move towards Task Force 8. It's just going to go in a straight line. It won't do me any good really to be here because he's just going to go right past me. So I'm going to move just one. Let him come to me. And then down here we have intercept group number one, Guam. And I'm going to move him one hex. And so that's going to cost, for air mission one, that's going to cost him one. I am going to move him one more. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to move him one more closer towards task force eight. And to do that, I've got to roll the D10. So let's do that. Actually, let me get a dice tower here. I don't think I got a dice tower out. We'll just put it, where can we put this so that it's out of the way? I think if we just put it, uh, 
uh, let's just put it here. I'll just roll it and move uh, so I can see the fuel expenditure. There we go. So I'm going to roll a D10, and this will tell me how much more fuel he expends in doing that. So I rolled an 8. That's not good. That means he expended two more fuel points to do that. So that was intercept group 1, 1, 2. So two more points expended. So it took a total of three to get that far. So I've already expended three fuel points for air mission number one. All right, so that is it for our groups. We have no more. And you'll note that on the game turn flow chart, they actually had that as two separate steps. So they have you move air missions and then next to it, it says adjust fuel markers. Well, that's, it's all one thing. So I, I do it in steps. You saw how I did it. That's how I'm gonna do it because it makes more sense to me. I'm gonna move a marker, adjust the fuel, move a marker, adjust the fuel. So that's why I did it that way. That is it for the U.S. air movement segment. And now we go to the U.S. interception segment down here. So that's air to air combat. The way that works is if we have any of our fighter groups in the same hex as an enemy fighter group, then we can attack. We can have air combat. That's not the case here. So nothing is going to happen in this U.S. air interception segment. So we go to the next segment. Well, remember in this scenario, you only have three segments you're going to use. So you go back to the Japanese air movement segment. So this is the first time for the Japanese to move their air group. And as the note said, the air raid group is going to move two hexes in a straight line towards its target. In this case, Task Force 58. So this air raid group is going to move two, one, two, and end up in the same hex as our intercept group. And that is it for the Japanese air movement segment. There's no combat there. We initiate combat. They're just beelining for that task force. So no combat, strictly move. Then we go to the next segment in the scenario, which is back to U.S. air movement. So we're down into U.S. air movement again. So for task force two, he's now in the same hex as the air raid group. I'm not going to move him. I'm going to keep him there because I want to attack the, this air raid group coming in. But... If you don't move, you still expend fuel. So it's going to cost me one fuel to keep intercept group, air mission group number two out there. So there's another fuel point expended to keep them in the hex. Back to intercept group number one. I'm going to move it one hex towards task force 58. So that's going to cost one fuel for air mission group number one. So that's down to five now. If you'll recall, we are now in to the second U.S. air movement segment. So we get these reinforcements. And the scenario book tells you what this represents are the fighters that were, they were on the deck here that actually launched while all this was going on. So now they're up in the air. You place your intercept group number three is now with Task Force 58. And in the air mission three, because remember we're corresponding numbers here, air mission three now has three of these Hellcats with it. And its fuel starts off at 14. So now these fuel counters normally have just fuel on them. And you put them down, mark, you know, your fuel. But on the back side of that, it's a plus 10. So if you have more than single digit fuel, you flip this over to its plus 10 side. So it's going to have 14. So we're going to put that on the 4. 4 plus 10 is 14. So he's got 14 fuel. That's good for him. So that is it. For, well, it's not quite it. I'm sorry. The... Rules also say that this intercept group, when he comes in as reinforcements, he can move. So I'm going to move intercept group number three into the same hex as the air raid that's coming in. So now we have intercept group three and two and that Japanese group all in the same hex. That's going to cost another fuel point for, well, not another. It's just going to cost a fuel point for air mission number three. They were at 14. Now they're down to 13. It expend one to move into that hex. Now we're done with the U.S. air movement segment. We advance the segment counter down to the next step in the scenario, which is U.S. interception, air-to-air -air combat. All right, so here we go. I'll grab the D10. We're going to need that. Let's set it aside here. So air combat, the way this is going to work is we have two air missions in here, two intercept missions that can attack the air raid group. So I'm gonna to wanna to use both of those in this attack. But to do so, I've gotta spend three fuel points for each of those missions. So for air mission two, I've gotta spend three fuel points. So that's gonna take him down to four, one, two, three. And for air mission three, that is gonna take him down to, he's at 13, so he's down to 10 now. 
And of course, Air Mission 1 is still out here. He can't participate, so he will not participate. So we've expended our fuel, three per air mission, and now we can attack. And the way this works, the Japanese have two fighters, and they have seven attack aircraft that are coming in for the attack. We have two fighters in Air Mission 2 and three fighters in Air Mission 3. So what we have to do here is determine which of our aircraft are fighters, which, how many fighters do we want to attack fighters, and how many of the remaining fighters do we want to attack the attack aircraft. So you look at your air-to-air -air combat table for the U.S. side, and all you're doing is the number of units you have firing is going to is going to determine which column you're on, and you're going to roll a d10, and that's how many Japanese forces you will eliminate. So we have two fighters. Uh, there is also a minimum to... So we have two fighters coming in for the Japanese. There's a minimum number that you have to apply your fighters to. So it's, it's two to one. So it says a minimum of one fighter unit per two Japanese escort points. So an escort is a, a fighter escorting those attack units. I don't really like the wording they use for aircraft here. I'm going to say that now. There, there's attack aircraft they call is what's attacking the targets, and then they call escorts or the fighters. It's just the terminology gets a little wonky for me. Minor complaint, that's on me, but I just I don't like the terminology they're using here. So it does confuse me a little bit sometimes. So it's saying, though, that for every two Japanese escort fighters, we're going to have to apply one of our fighters. So here they have two exactly. So I'm going to have to put a minimum of one fighter to try to intercept their fighters. But I don't want to do that. I want to knock down as many fighters as I can. And then another thing to note is when we're attacking these fighters, we're going to get a minus one to our roll on this table because if a target is a fighter, then it's a minus one modifier to the roll. So I've got to determine how many fighters I want to go after their fighters. And then here's another minor complaint with the game, but it works out. Fortunately, to our benefit, the way they cut this map, you're going to have to allocate these you, these fighter units to their fighters and their attack units. If you look real closely, there's a line where the, the map folds that runs right along this air mission group. What I do, what, I, what I've decided to do is, in this little, to the right of this line, that's where I'm going to put units that are attacking their fighters. I think I'm going to have, so again, we're, this is only air mission two and three, because one's not there yet. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put this to the right of that, that line on the map to show that he's attacking fighters. And I'm gonna put another one with him. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, do I wanna put maybe one more? Right now I'm on the two column. If I put one more, that's gonna put me on a three column. It's a little bit better odds that I'll hit something. Um, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna move another one over we're going to have three of our fighters go after three of their fighters. These remaining two fighters are going to go after their attack aircraft. And so I'm going to show that by, like I said, anything to the right of this line is attacking a fighter. Combat is simultaneous. We're going to fire. They're going to fire. So if we knock all their aircraft out of, all their fighters out of the air, they're still going to get to attack us at two because they have two fighters. So let's roll for us first. And let's see. This may be able to, I'll just leave the die tray there. We, we might be able to see it. So we are on, so I got three fighters, so that's going to put us on the three column. And we're going to roll and see what we get. Remember, we're at a minus one because we're attacking fighters. So I roll a nine, that's really good, but a nine minus one is an eight, still really good. So if we look at the three column, nine minus one is eight, so we get a two. What does the two mean? That means that we destroyed two Japanese air points. Well, that's all they had up here, so these fighters are gone. I'm going to put them in the air points lost to show that they are now gone. But they do get to return fire before they go away. They had two points of, of aircraft, so we start on the two column, and they attack us. And they rolled a 10. That's not good. High numbers are bad. So they rolled a 10. That's a result of an E. So an E, if we look, it tells us that one target unit is eliminated. So we've lost one of our fighters. I'm just going to take one out of air mission three. And uh, we'll just put him down here and lost. Air units lost, not in a task force hex. They're over here next to the task force. And so now we go to our, our other two aircraft, which are attacking their attack aircraft. So we're going to roll again. This time we're on the two column, because we only have two of those fighters going after their aircraft. 
roll a 10 again. So 10 minus one. Well, in this case, it's not a minus one because we're attacking attack aircraft and not fighters. So two of their aircraft are eliminated. So we show that by removing two of their aircraft. So now they have five attack aircraft left, and that is it. That's a pretty good result. That's really good. Couldn't have done better. They don't fire back because they're attack aircraft. They're not fighters, so they do not get to return fire. And that is going to end the U.S. intercept phase. Then we go back up to the Japanese air movement segment. So this air raid group is going to continue on to its target. So it's, it's found Task Force 58. That's where it's going to stop. No further action. We go right to the U.S. Move, air movement segment again. So let's start now with intercept one, which is air mission number one. Now they can move one. So let's deduct our fuel point. They're down to four. And that's going to put them in the same hex as that air raid group and the task force and everybody, really. Intercept group number three is down here. We're going to spend a fuel point. So let's flip this counter. And he's now down to nine, or they're now down to nine. And let's put these fighters back. So now we're down to nine for air mission intercept group three. Now they're in the same hex. Now air mission one, I'm going to move into that hex too. So now he's going to come into this hex. They're all in the hex. That's going to cost him a fuel point. That's it for the U.S. air movement segment. We've got a big ball of fighters and everything in that hex over that task force. So we move down to now the intercept again. And if you read it, where it talks about the game duration again, once the, the air raid has reached Task Force 58, which it has, and the U.S. Inter interception segment has been concluded, the game ends. So this is it. This will be the last round of combat. All right, so we do the same thing again. So we have all of our fighters are present now, except for the one that got shot down. And we want to allocate how many do we want to go after fighters? How many do we want to go after the attack units? Well, there's no more fighters. So these are all going to go after the Japanese attack aircraft. So everybody's going to spend their fuel. Well, wait a minute here. Let's see. So back to the scenario, it says U.S. fuel. Any air unit which reaches fuel level zero is immediately removed from play. So air mission number one, if we spend three fuel, they're going to go down to zero, which that will remove them from play. They won't even get to attack. So I don't think I want to do that. So I don't think Air Mission 1 is going to get to be able to participate in this. It's going to only be Air Mission 2 and Air Mission 3. We're going to pay the fuel cost for Air Mission 2. That's going to take him down to 1. And then for Air Mission 3, he's got to spend 3. So that's going to take him down to 6. So we only have these four aircraft now. All four of these are going to attack the Japanese attack wave. And it's the same thing. A little different here, though, because we're not going to have to worry about fighters coming in. So we have four aircraft attacking. So that's going to put us on the four column. We want to roll high here. So we will fire. We get a seven. There's no minus one because all the fighters are gone. The four column, a seven, is two. So they're going to lose two units. So that's going to take them down to three. So let me grab a, another naval air unit marker. And we will put this down to three. So really, I, I don't know if you're supposed to keep track of how many of these units you've shot down. You probably are. I imagine if you're playing a full game, you, this probably has more meaning. But for this scenario, I don't think it does. But we're going to show that those two aircraft are lost over there. They're down to three. And then there's no return fire here because it, they were the attack aircraft. That is going to end the U.S. intercept phase. And that's going to end this scenario. So that's going to take us, let's see, let's look at the victory conditions again. Uh, the game is concluded. The game ends in USS victory. So four or fewer air points for the Japanese remaining is a U.S. victory. Well, we've won. So they only have three air points remaining. U.S. victory. We won. <laughs> okay. But what the scenario is showing you is just how these air intercept and the air combat works. That is it. If I did anything wrong, let me know in the comments below. We want to learn how to do this game together. It is not a, I'm not going to say, you know, we talked about you having a PhD or somebody's talked about having a PhD to get through this game. I don't think you're going to need that. I really don't. It's not an easy rule book to go through though. It's, it's going to take some time to learn this and that's what we're doing here. And I am going to go through. So the next scenario is 
Scenario two, get to the carriers. That's probably the one we're gonna do next. Scenario three is turkey shoot. Uh, looks like they're getting a little more involved. Scenario four is enemy fleet sighted, and I think that's probably the last, or maybe five will be the last one we go through. I don't know, we'll see. We'll, we'll definitely keep doing these in order, I guess, if, if you like this. I mean, so that's another thing. Let me know in the comments below if you want to see me continue on through the tutorial scenarios, learning this together, or if you just say, you know what, no, just go off and learn the rules, come back and show us the whole game. I think that this is a lot more useful, a lot more helpful to, uh, to have. I wished I would have had something like this to look at when I was learning this, because like I said, there are some, uh, I won't say, there's nothing really wrong with the rule book, but it, it was kind of hard for me to, to wrap my head around some of the concepts. And again, part of that is because of the terminology they use. And maybe once I get used to that, it won't be the case anymore. I do not know, but that is it. There you go. So let me know if this was useful. You'd like to see scenario two. And if I did anything wrong, also let me know that. And uh, as always, thank you for watching. Subscribe if you haven't, so you can figure out when the next video is coming up. Please like the video because that is always helpful to the channel. And uh, I will see you back here next time. Thanks for watching.